and your hearing and vision better be laser sharp as well with uncorrected 2020 vision. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You're wrong. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Mondays with Mover. I am Mover C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. Uh, if you haven't picked those up, please do. Also, the audiobook for Alex Shepard's uh, Absolute Vengeance is available uh, at iTunes, Audible, or Amazon. So please pick those up and leave a review. It helps. This is an author vlog. It helps the channel. Uh, I know we, last week I talked about this doing a um, night vision goggle episode this week, but uh, today I actually thought I would change it up and we'll do the night vision goggle thing some other time, but today <clears throat> I wanted to address a video I saw um, on YouTube a couple days ago and uh, it's along the theme of the career advice that I give. You know, the last video we talked about make them tell you no and I've talked about the five myths of becoming a fighter pilot and how, how I became a fighter pilot, how Gonky became a fighter pilot and such. And I came across this video called, Could You Become a U.S. Military Fighter Pilot? <clears throat> And uh, the thumbnail said most don't have what it takes. So it, it piqued my curiosity because, you know, a lot of what I talk about is people that self-eliminate because someone or something told them that they didn't have a shot. So I wanted to see kind of what the most recent um, view on this is from somebody who probably has no qualifications whatsoever. Uh, it's a fancy infographic and I thought we'd do a react video, watch it together. I'll talk about what's right in the video and uh, some of the misinformation because I think there's a lot of misinformation. Fighter pilots around the world have undoubtedly uh, the coolest job yeah, there's in a MiG history. 29. They get to fly Two around MiG the 29s. sky in the fastest jets ever created and rule over the air like giant metal birds of prey. If you want to fly some of the most technologically advanced aircraft in the world though, you're going to have to make the move to the United States. But how exactly do you get from nothing but a dream of soaring through the skies to piloting the F-22 or F-35? Okay, so their intro, their thesis statement is, you know, how do you get from zero to hero? So. Uh, today we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Hello it. and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're going to take a look at how to become a U.S. So fighter So they're going to tell you how to become a U.S. fighter pilot. Though it used to be that pilot. enlisted men could become fighter pilots, that practice has long been out of style. And today you're going to have to become an officer in order to fly the biggest, meanest jets in the world. Okay, so first thing right off the bat, uh, you have to become an officer to fly the biggest, meanest jets in the world. That's true. Uh, there are enlisted uh, RPA, which is uh, remote piloted aircraft positions, but um, you do have to become an officer to be a fighter pilot. You do have to be an officer to be um, any military pilot, minus uh, there are some warrant officer flight training uh, programs uh, in the Army. Uh, yeah, so that part's true. Yeah, you do have to become an officer. That means you'll need at least a four-year degree from an accredited university and be at least 18 years old so you can enlist in the U.S. military. Okay, so this is a semantics thing, but it's important to, to talk about. You do have to have a four-year degree. You do have to be able to commission, but you're not enlisting. So we separate officer and enlisted. The officer ranks have gone through OCS and all that stuff. The enlisted are you know, E1 through E9. So you're not actually enlisting in the military when you become an officer. I know they probably didn't mean anything by that, but it, it's an important distinction. You don't enlist and then become an officer. Joining the Air Force, you'll have to undergo 12 weeks of officer school at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. While if you're a seaman, you'll have to go to <laughs> the seaman. Navy's Officer Candidate School in Rhode Island. For those jarheads out there, you'll be attending Officer Candidate School in Virginia. But don't think... Okay, so... Right off the bat, those are three ways to commission. I talked about this in, in one of my other videos, but they're not the only ways. Uh, for the Navy side, and he kind of uh, mixes the terms a little bit, and I think that's, that's bad because it, there's really separate tracks for this. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the Air Force side. For the Air Force, how do you become an officer? You can go through the Air Force Academy, which that gets your four-year degree simultaneously. You can go through Air Force ROTC through a college, which also gets your degree while you're becoming an officer. 
or you can go to officer training school, which is what he's talking about. It's a 12 week program. Uh, and OTS, the subsets of that, you can go as an active duty member, or you can go as a reservist, or you can go as an Air National Guard uh, member. So that's not the only way. On the Navy side, there are a couple different ways to do it. There's obviously the Naval Academy, which both uh, Marines and the Navy can go to. Uh, there is the ROTC, which again, Marines and Navy can go to. And then there's uh, the Newport, Rhode Island, which is what he was talking about, OCS for the, uh, for the Navy. And then Marines can go to the uh, uh, Quantico, which the Air Force doesn't have. So uh, that's another option as well. Um, and if it looks like I'm looking off screen, actually for the Navy side, I went and reached out to a buddy of mine, uh, Greg, who's a Navy fighter pilot to make sure I get this right because being accurate is important. So let's, let's continue. That just because you're training to become an officer, whom even the most senior enlisted men will have to salute, that okay, senior enlisted men have to salute. Nobody cares. This is a stupid point. Okay, yeah, you're you outrank as a second lieutenant. You outrank the senior enlisted, but okay, great. TS is going to be easy because it's not. You'll basically be going back to boot camp, and though you may end up with your officer pips at the end, you're going to be treated like dirt. For okay, no. Uh, officer training school is hard. It's not an easy program. It is physically demanding. It is mentally demanding. There's a lot to it. However, uh, you're not going to be treated like dirt. You're going to be treated like a professional. You're going to be treated like a future officer. Uh, the days of, you know, full metal jacket and officer and a gentleman and all that stuff. That's not how it works. You're going to be treated as an adult and you're going to be expected to lead and you're going to be expected to show that you can lead troops. So to say that you're going to be treated like dirt, I mean, that's it's okay. Yeah, it's physically demanding, but it's not that bad. The duration once at officer training school, if your dream is to pilot a multi-million dollar airplane, you'll first need to pass qualifying tests such as the okay. That's false. So, uh, let's talk air force and then Navy, the qualifying tests, uh, are pre OTS. You're going to take the AFOQT prior to even getting a pilot slot. If you, let's say you went off the street active duty, you're going to apply for the pilot slot. You're going to have the AFOQT done. You're going to have the, uh, uh, the TBAT, TBAS now done what used to be the, uh, the BAT test, but you'll have a PCSM pilot candidate selection method. You'll have all the testing done. You don't do this at OTS. And that, that also applies uh, for the Navy. That's called the ASTB. You take it prior to OCS, not after. So all these tests, you know, at o OTS or OCS, you're taking these classes prior to, uh, you even get there. And once you're there, you're just learning how to be an officer. None of this other stuff applies. So, uh, this is demonstrably false. And for guard reserve, you will already have your scores. You've already taken the AFOQT and all that stuff. U.S. Navy and Marine Corps Aviation Selection Test Battery. These tests ensure that you have the mental skills and knowledge needed to be entrusted with the most expensive weapons ever created. Though you okay, no, the tests make sure you have the aptitude uh, to be a pilot. That's it. It's not to be entrusted with the most expensive whatever. It just makes sure you have the aptitude, you have the, the basic skill sets, you have a grasp of the English language, basic math, all this stuff. If you study for it, it's not that hard. So, I mean, and also, again, this happens before OTS. So they're way out of order in, in how this is working. Can fail. It generally lessens your odds dramatically of getting a billet as a top fighter jock to do so. You can fail, but it lessens your odds of getting a fighter jock. False. There's no such thing as fail. There are minimum scores. And if you don't get the minimum scores, you're not going to get an officer candidate slot. You're not going to get an OTS slot. So uh, you're not going to get a pilot slot. The, you have to separate the fighter pilot part and the flying part. If you're active duty, for example, you're not even going to know you're going to be a fighter pilot until pilot training. If you're a reservist or a guard guy, yes, you will know, but a unit's not going to hire you. So th this is just wrong. I mean, the, you, you, the idea that this test will make you a fighter pilot is false. Do so. Hey, there's plenty of open spots driving mule trucks or big fat cargo planes. If okay, that's the worst part of this video, big fat cargo planes. Let's talk about that for a second. First of all, every mission in the Air Force and the military is a support mission. The, just because you're flying a cargo plane doesn't mean you're any lesser of a pilot than anyone else. Second, 
as an active duty pilot in UPT, you will not know what you're going to fly until you track select, which is at the end of T6s uh, for both Navy and the Air Force. I mean, you, you, that's where you, you, know, you kind of start separating fighters from heavies and helos and all that stuff. So this test has nothing to do with that. This, the, if you don't pass the test, you won't get a pilot slot. That's it. The, the performance in pilot training is what determines what you do. So it doesn't matter if you, what your commissioning source is. It doesn't matter what your scores are. It doesn't matter what your GPA is. It matters how you do in pilot training once you start flying. Next, you'll need to pass all the necessary physical qualifications. High performance aircraft require high performance people. And when your body is going oh, to be God, good, no, it, no, okay. The physical fitness is the basic Navy PRT or the Air Force uh, PT test, which is a mile and a half push ups and sit ups. Uh, it has nothing to do with being a fighter pilot. It, it is a commissioning requirement, it is a service requirement, but there is no special test for being a fighter pilot. The only special test that's physical for being a fighter pilot, and it's not a test, it's training, is the centrifuge. The centrifuge sucks, but again, you do that when you're already in pilot training and you've already got a fighter slot. So uh, I don't know what they're talking about here about, I mean, yes, I agree. You do have to be in top physical condition to be a fighter pilot, but that there's no testing specific to being a fighter pilot. Added by the stresses of several G-forces, you better be in peak physical condition to have a chance of becoming a fighter pilot. You need to be able to avoid passing out or vomiting. Has when nothing to, to do with the PT test. And your hearing and okay. vision better be laser sharp as well. With uncorrected 2020 vision. Don't know where they got that. Absolutely wrong. False. For both the Navy and the Air Force. I believe the Navy's 2040 corrected to 2020. The Air Force now is 2200 far corrected to 2020. 2200. That's like legally blind. If you can correct your vision to 2020, you, you can wear glasses. You can have different forms of LASIK, PRK, and all that stuff. But... This myth about 2020 vision uncorrected is wrong. And I, I was reading the comments, and that's part of the problem is guys watch this, guys and girls, they watch this and go, oh, I wear glasses, I can't be a fighter pilot. Just make them tell you no. Go, go actually try it. Go research it. Go find the reg that says what the vision requirements are. Do your homework. Don't let a YouTube video with Russian planes tell you that you can't be a fighter pilot and ruin your dream. Sorry. Next, you'll have to agree to the time commitment the Navy and Marine pilots must commit to at least eight years of active duty, but the Air Force demands a long-term minimum commitment of at least 10 years. Once you sign that contract, The commitments are once you get your wings. You, have, you incur an eight-year commitment or a 10-year commitment once you, com once you get your wings. You've, you've winged, you've finished pilot training. So, uh, so it actually ends up being closer to 12 total. However, if you wash out, if you self-eliminate during training and cross a sign, you're not going to have this commitment. This commitment is not prior to pilot training. It's after. Contract, there's no going back. But why would you want to? Now things get real, and you'll start your initial training to become a top ace. First will be aviation pre-flight indoctrination, a six-week program consisting of four weeks of academic classes and two weeks of survival training. You will, after all, be flying over a variety of terrains and often over enemy lines. During your four weeks of academic classes, you can also expect concurrent water training. Okay. This is all, for whatever reason, they're talking about being a fighter pilot, and then they exclusively start talking about Navy stuff. API, uh, all this ground in dock stuff, this water stuff is all 100% uh, Navy. And on the Air Force side, here's how it works. You go to uh, OCS, you get your pilot slot, you get your class date. And then you go to pilot training, typically. Pilot training is broken up into three phases. Phase one is academics. So you'll, you'll do uh, basic parachute stuff, parachute landing, training, PLFs, uh, which has a little bit of parasailing, okay. No water, no water yet. Um, and there's no swimming requirement in the, in the Air Force, in case you were wondering. Then you go to uh, academics. So you'll get the aerospace physiology, weather, navigation, systems for the T-6 Texan. Uh, and then in phase two, you'll fly the T-6, and then you'll track select, and you'll either fly the T-1, uh, or you'll go to helos, or you'll fly the T-38. So, um, 
All this stuff that they're about to talk about, most of it's inaccurate, but it's also 100% for the Navy. This is not. So I'm going to read the notes for this stuff because this is not Air Force. This is what I went through. I went through Air Force pilot training. But uh, Greg helped me out here, and this is uh, Navy, and a lot of this is wrong too. So surprise. With swimming survival skills that culminate in a one-mile swim while in a flight suit, your classes will include topics such as aerodynamics, weather, and navigation with an exam given at the end of each course. If you fail, that's a wrap for you. Oh, false. If you fail a test, uh, it does affect your ranking in the class, but depending on the policy at the time, it is not an automatic washout. Uh, there, there is time available, so no, that's, that's also false. And your grades are extremely competitive. Make it yeah, past the academic right. portion though, and you'll enter the survival training phase, during which you'll learn basic land survival, how to use survival equipment, physiology, and first aid. After okay. They make this sound like this is SEER, uh, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. In the Air Force, SEER happens after pilot training, and in the Navy it does too. So this is not SEER, it's not this hard, it, it's basic, so wrong. For aviation pre-flight indoctrination, you'll be sent to primary training, <sighs> okay, where primary you'll get the chance to start actually two. flying a plane. But don't think you'll be hopping into the seat okay, of this is a like multi-million a dollar or killing machine just yet. You'll start out on what is known as a trainer aircraft. For the Navy, that includes aircraft such as the T-6B Texan II, a propeller-driven aircraft that's a far cry that's from a modern jet. But you'll learn essential flight okay. skills on... The, the, they downplay the T6. The Texan's a great airplane. It, you know, 1200 shaft horsepower. It's got an ejection seat. It's high performance. It's 250 knots. It red lines at like 310, 315, something like that. It, but that, the, what's on the screen is not a T6. And um, it, it is a very high performance trainer. So to act like that the T6, you know, you're just going to be flying around in a Cessna is just inaccurate these underpowered planes that will prepare you for the real deal. During primary, you'll go through yet another- Oh, by the way, when they say such as the T6, it's only the T6. There's, there's no other trainer, so that's- Other okay. series of academic classes, but intermixed with time spent on flight simulators and actual flight time in your trainer aircraft. You'll first learn basic flight skills and move into aerobatics. Learn about the different instruments and how to fly in formation. As always, you'll be graded on absolute... Okay, this is mostly correct. Uh, it always starts with academic sim time and then flight time. These are MiG-29s, which you will not fly in any military flight training in the United States. So, unless you're a comrade. ...every bit of progress you make, and failure means you go home. No. Failure does not mean you go home. If you bust a ride, hook a ride, as we say, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're done. It means that you might get more training. Uh, your ranking will suffer. You might not get your first pick, but that doesn't mean you're just done. So, uh, no. So, on the Air Force side, um, you know, it's the, it's the basic uh, pre-contact, contact, formation, instruments, navigate. Uh, I don't know if they still do, they do any low levels now or not. I know they've changed up the syllabus a little bit, but uh, formation and instruments. And what that is, you know, it just gets you the basics of military flying and the basic instruments and stuff like that. So, I mean, and that's, that repeats in phase three. This is mostly actually correct for the, for the Navy. Um, if you, know, you successfully complete primary, you'll be given the chance to fill out a dream sheet for the type of aircraft you'd like to fly. Based on no. your preference, your grades, and needs of the service, you'll get an assignment and no. head out. No. Um, primary, both primary for the Air Force and the Navy, um, that is a track select. You can request heavies, fighters, helos. So at this point, you finish T6s, now you track select a fighter. You don't get your specific aircraft assignment until post um, advanced training or um, in the Air Force after the end of T-38, so. Naval aviator wanting to fly fighter jets, that will include a transfer to one of the Navy's two fighter flight schools in either Texas or Mississippi. They're not fighter flight schools, it's just advanced. It's T-45s. Where you'll learn to fly the T-45 Ghost Hawk. It's the Ghost Hawk, and this is an Still F4. not a fighter jet, but definitely no prop plane. The Ghost Hawk will introduce you to the basics of flying advanced jet aircraft. 
you'll first undergo phase one training, where you'll undergo much of the same training you went through in primary training, but with classes refined for jet aircraft. Generally correct. While in primary, you may have learned how to fly in formations of two aircraft. Here you'll learn how to fly in formations Air Force, of this four is not correct. and learn tactical you start out formation flying. With academics. You're now training to be a proper fighter pilot. Phase two, however, is at last where you'll learn how to fight like a top ace. Okay, I wouldn't call it a top ace. You learn, so on the Navy side, it's the same as IFF in the Air Force. So in the Air Force, you will have, you already have your wings by the time you get to this. Uh, and this is called Intro to Fighter Fundamentals, and you're learning basic fighter maneuvers, which is basic dogfighting, offensive BFM, defensive BFM, high aspect, basic setups to be a wingman. You're not learning anything this advanced. Uh, and on the Navy side, same thing. Top ace is a bit of a stretch. It's intro and exposures that you'll see in a strike fighter aircraft. With training on combat formation flying and the principles on unguided bombing, low altitude attacks, and CCIP bombing are constantly computed impact point. Okay, they make, I don't know why, somebody it gave them the buzzword of CCIP. Tactical formation flying is something you're going to have in phase two and three in pilot training. You will have this before you get to IFF and you're probably gonna have this in T-45s too. Principles of unguided bombing. What unguided bombing means is a dumb bomb, like a Mark 82, Mark 84. The bomb itself has no guided kit. I don't know why they think CCIP bombing doesn't have the same effect as unguided. They might mean manual bombing where you crank the mills in, but we don't do that in IFF. Uh, so CCIP is kind of a HUD thing. It's, it's, it's a function of the HUD, CCRP being uh, constantly computed release points. So I don't know where, where they got this, but it's irrelevant. A system that shows you where your payload is expected to impact depending on where and yeah, when you great. release it. The last half of phase two will include air combat maneuvering or dogfighting, where you'll learn how to defend the friendly skies or take them from your enemy. You'll learn flight skills to help you defeat an opponent one on one, or even how to fight and win against two separate attackers simultaneously. No, we don't do 1v2. That's not, no, that's not a thing. You do 2v1, where it's you and another blue fighter, your flight lead, versus one bandit or 1v1. We don't do 1v2 in, in this early in training. If you're wanting to be a naval aviator, you'll then head over for carrier qualifications, one of the hardest flight training programs in the world. Okay, Landing now they just a went full Navy. Moving carrier in the middle of night amidst a pitching sea has often been described as the most terrifying experience any pilot can undergo. But you'll learn how to do just that. No, uh, the T-45 does not land on the boat at night. That is something that the, happens at the RAG, which is your F-18, F-35. Um, training. You will have your wings before you land on the boat at night. This is T-45 stuff is just very basic. Upon completion, or for Navy and U.S. Marine Corps pilots, you'll then go to advanced training in the jet you'll ultimately fly. Depend okay. Advanced training was the T-45. I don't know why they're calling the RAG advanced training, but uh, same applies. So at this point in the Navy, you have your wings and then you go to F-18 school. At this point in the Air Force, uh, you've already had your wings because you've been doing IFF and now you're going to what's called the B course for F-16, F-35, F-22, whatever. Depending on the airframe, this can include air to ground bombing, the practice and use of smart weapons, and advanced dogfighting tactics. At the end of your training, you'll be pitted up against your instructors with a chance to get revenge on all the hell you've been put through as No. No, there is no that's ridiculous. There is no get revenge on your instructors with a graduation students for in, versus instructor thing. That's ridiculous. In the B course and in the RAG, you are training to be a combat wingman. So they are teaching you the basics of the aircraft and how to employ the aircraft. At the end, you will be on an instructor's wing and maybe do a large force employment exercise, but you're not fighting your instructors and giving them hell or payback or, or whatever this says. You engage in a mock battle. Becoming a U.S. fighter pilot is a long, arduous task That's with true. training courses developed from decades of experience also flying true. combat missions over unfriendly skies all around the world. Though many will apply, few will ultimately receive their wing. True. And in fact, qualifications are... Okay, not true. Many will apply, yes. It, it, there aren't very many that are selected, true. Uh, a lot of people self-eliminate, self self as we've talked about. A lot of people 
can't get through with medical, physical, they just can't do basic um, military stuff or they have problems with um, the testing. Once you're in, the washout rate is not that high. So once you're in the pipeline and training and you've made it, you've been selected, it's it's very rare to wash out. So to say that, you know, it's it's this weedy out process as you go through is I mean it's that's false. So strict that the Air Force currently has only 75% of the pilots it needs. No. That the 75%, which that's number's not even right. The reason there's a shortage of fighter pilots is because there's a retention problem. There's no shortage of applicants, there's no shortage on the front end. It's keeping 04s, major senior captains from bailing to the airlines from, you know, once they get the end of that 10 year commitment, keeping them staying. Uh, and a lot of that, that's a different video altogether, but there is no shortage of applicants. There's a shortage of um, 04s and, and senior captains. So this is false. Means there's room for you if you think you've got what it takes to fly the most advanced aircraft ever this. built. What do you think would be the hardest part of the training? The I love this. So they sit there and tell you you can't do it and then say, well, we're hiring. So yeah, if you think so, what's the bottom line of this? I don't mean to just tear up this video. You know, it's fun to do and all that stuff. But my point in all of this is the, the YouTube was full of videos like this. The, the Internet is full of, of stuff like this. Uh, I had people telling me I couldn't do it. Uh, I've had people on the channel, and I'm going to have more people on the channel as we go. And it's false. It's absolutely false. You can do it. You need to make somebody in a position of power tell you no. Don't don't let this YouTube thing because, like I, I should just showed you, half this stuff is wrong. Um, this this kind of thing just doesn't help the profession at all. It's a fancy infographic with a lot of Russian airplanes that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's wrong. It's just it's just false. So get the information. I've got some other videos, the five minutes of becoming a fighter pilot, you know, how do you become a fighter pilot, what first steps you need to take. Use the links in the description, flyingsquadron.com, bogeydope.com, those places. Do the research yourself. Find out what's required and then go get it. So this comes from Yuri, and he sent this all the way from Amsterdam, which uh, is by far the farthest uh, for any mover mailbag stuff. Anyway, so let's see what we got. Check this out. The Fighting Bengals F-18D Hornet. So the family model. Cool. And it is a... that out. Marine Hornet, VMFA 224. Thanks, Yori. Check that out. That's cool. And, but wait, there's more. Uh-oh, lost an afterburner nozzle. Move that back on. Um, in here, like a kid at Christmas. There is a stick to put this on. Mountain for to go flying and oh, check it out it's an F-16 oh, no kidding oh, that's awesome check this out this I never flew blue if they're flying blue now that's awesome this Florida Makos. It's a homestead jet. 35th anniversary, 10th Air Force homestead jet. Check that out. That is awesome. That is badass. So, uh, Yori, dude, that's awesome. I'm gonna have to have a uh, dog fight. This is the appropriate position, by the way. You know, the... no, I'm just kidding. Um, this is awesome. Yori, thank you. Anyway, so uh, if you'd like to send me something uh, to the mover mailbag, please feel free. Uh, the P.O. box is going to be on the screen somewhere, uh, and I will feature it. I appreciate it so much. Yori, I will be sending you something soon. Um, so anyway, thanks. All right, so I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Mondays with Mover. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff. People are going to put videos out there. 
uh, do your homework, find out what's real, find out what's just somebody getting views. The reason I did this, it had half a million views. I mean, the guy's got 4 million subscribers. So that's a lot of misinformation or a lot of people receiving misinformation. If you read the comments, a lot of people thought that it was accurate. You know, people were like, oh, crush my dreams. Oh, this is, you know, oh, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, but now I'm not. Well, first of all, don't give up so easily. And second, do your homework. So hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I'll get to the NVG episode at a later date. Uh, but I hope uh, to see you again soon. I did pass my check ride. Uh, for those of you that follow me on Instagram, at CW Lemoyne, I posted the picture uh, as soon as I was done. Uh, so I'm now qualified in the T-38A. Now I move on to start uh, wingman qualification and then eventually flight league qualification. So i uh, got a little bit more work to do, but uh, it's great to finally be qualified in an Air Force aircraft again. It's awesome. It's been seven years since my last Form 8 and two years since I you know, was qualified in a military aircraft. So it's a great feeling. Uh, hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.